Welcome to the second of our summer game plan webinar series, where we're trying to provide more information, resources, and inspiration to school and community-based educators across the state as we prepare for the coming summer and figure out the best ways to support young people given the year we've had. The Partnership for Children and Youth has been invested in summer learning and statewide efforts to increase access for many years because we believe our ability to provide high quality, engaging summer learning experiences to young people is a core piece of the puzzle when it comes to achieving equity. There are obviously a lot of challenges to planning and operating summer learning this year, but there are also a lot of opportunity given increased public resources and the resilience we have seen across all stakeholders in our education system this year. Since our last web webinar at the end of February, the California legislature and the governor passed AB 86, which included a historic 4.6 billion for expanded and summer learning opportunities. This money is going out to school districts now and is intended to be used this summer throughout the next school year and the summer of 2022. This funding is on top of the American Rescue Plan Act, which was the federal education stimulus round three and also provided significant resources for expanded and summer learning. We have put a funding guide that was just released around these funding streams and it will be shared in the chat. In the past, the biggest challenge for summer programs has always been funding, but for this summer, that's not the case. But as we have been in discussion with districts and community partners across the state, staffing has come up again and again as the number one challenge, which is why this is the focus for our discussion today and also will be a core theme in all of the content and webinars we offer in this series. Today, we have two great panels for you that bring a huge amount of experience operating and supporting a wide range of schools, districts, communities, and in turn, multiple staffing models. Our goal for today is that you all walk away with a better understanding of the different summer learning staffing models, the variety of roles for teachers, administrators, expanded learning staff, and many more. Also some advice on summer learning recruitment and training strategies, and how summer can grow more effective teachers and staff for the school year and far beyond. Today, we will focus on hearing directly from practitioners that operate and plan summer programs. But before we, want, we jump into the panels, I just wanna flag that there is existing research and resources on summer staffing that illustrate many of the themes you're going to hear today. One of them is from the RAND Corporation and the others is from the Summer Matters Campaign. And these resources will also be shared in the chat. So some key themes from the research and examples that you will hear today show that summer is not a one size fits all model and has always been a time to think outside the box and experiment with new schedules and staffing models. This summer, more than ever, it will require an all hands on deck approach. Schools will need to look beyond school personnel and bring community partners and others to the table. This summer, programs should prioritize developing the conditions for strengthening connections and community building, enrichment and play. Additionally, programs should target and proactively seek input from the most underserved students and their families in designing summer programs. It's very important to point out the research shows that both teachers and expanded learning staff improve their teaching and leadership skills as well as their connections with students and families after working in summer learning programs. But as you will hear from our speakers, this all requires intentional planning, curriculum development, continuous improvement and capacity building. So before we get started with the panel, 
our panel, just want a quick reminder that this webinar is part of a series and we have a few topics lined up, but we'd love to hear from you. And on the last note, we will do Q&A after each panel rather than saving it to the end. So please start sending questions in the chat um, as soon as they come to you and we will be following them and being sure to integrate them into the program. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel of speakers. We have Tasha Fock, who has 10 years of experience as a school site administrator. She has worked in Kerman Unified for three years and has helped run the Kessa Summer Program. She currently serves as the assistant principal for Kerman Floyd Elementary School. We also have Titus Carvon, who has worked in the expanded learning field for 14 years. He's previously worked as an expanded learning tutor and coordinator until his current position as the program coordinator in Fresno County Office of Education. He has been in directly involved with summer learning programs for over seven years. Additionally, we have Amanda Martinez, who has over 10 years of expanded learning and summer program experience. While working for the California Teaching Fellows Foundation, she's assumed many roles, including tutor, site lead, and site liaison. As a senior site liaison, she currently see, oversees all teaching fellows who are a part of expanded learning under the Fresno County Office of Education. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Titus to kick us off for the first panel. All right, hello, 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 good morning. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, with you guys so I can control our slides. So give me one second. There we go. That's a lot of things on my computer. Sorry about that. Uh, the presenter. All right, so as I am just trying to figure out how to get this into presenter mode. Uh, you know, I'll, st I'll start talking. Um, so hello, my name is Titus, I I'm with uh, Fresno County Office of Education. Um, and so we're here to present to you guys about the KISA Summer Enrichment Program. Um, this program came about actually as a, as a, a thought idea um, from working with the Summer Matters campaign uh, when I first got hired with Fresno County Office of Ed um, to highlight obviously summer learning loss and everything that comes, comes with that. And so with KISA, it it was a partnership that was born from multiple ideas of how we were going to uh, appease parents, engage students, and also align with the district goals that we needed to do. And so it was a multitude of things um, with this partnership with our county office, Kerman Unified and California Teaching Fellows um, <clears throat> of us working together to reach that goal. And, and out of that came, came the KISA program. And so the KISA program um, actually serves 600 kids and we target from kinder to eighth grade. So within KISA, KISA is actually split into two separate programs, um, which we'll show right here, which is KISA Junior, um, which <clears throat> is our technically kinder through third, and then KISA Big, which is our fourth through eighth grades. Uh, it's based off of enrichment, uh, academics, and a STEM component of, of some sort. And, and in this, our staffing that we focus on is with California Teaching Fellows, which employs uh, college students, actually college students who are interested in going into teaching um, and work in our expanded learning programs currently. And so <clears throat> that partnership in itself enables us to work with the districts, work with staff who are working with these kids already within their programs, and then allow us to align student likes with uh, workers who aren't that uh, big in, in an age gap. There's not that much of an age gap between the two. Um, Amanda and Tosh, feel free to step in um, at any point if, if, I'm, if I'm missing anything on, on, that, on that note. Um, 
And so actually, I will toss it to Tasha just to talk about uh, the district partnership portion um, and then the financing uh, in terms of the grants that we, we use, if you don't mind. All right, thank you, Titus. Um, Yes, I'm Tasha Foth and I'm an assistant principal, but I've ran the KISA program um, back in 2019 when we had a summer program and just wanted to talk to you a little bit about how um, Fresno County and teaching fellows works together. So Titus, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I kind of just want to talk about the differences in the two approaches that we have. Um, this year, our, our staffing looks a little bit different than it has in the past. I think we've ran our KISA program for several years now in Kerman. Um, and in the past, it was you know housed at one site with all K-8 students at one site, about 650, 600 students. Um, there was a principal that the district employed, um, a secretary that the district employed. Um, we had an LVN on site, IT on site, and some different positions there you can see um that that were all district personnel and then we partnered with california teaching fellows to make sure that we hired um, a staff of about 50 50 kind of college students that came and ran that kisa program um, as principal i oversaw the program and it worked really well that partnership um, it developed a lot of a lot of future teachers, I think, because they were in charge of a lot of students throughout the day. Um, it was a full day program and really emphasized enrichment um, and, and different activities for students. Well, due to the different circumstances this last year, we are approaching KISA a little bit differently um, at Kerman Unified. And we have um, now kind of, rearranged our program and each elementary school as well as the middle school will run a summer program at their own site and so that's one of the main differences this year um, we're looking to expand our number to include about 875 students total throughout the district um, there will be a principal on each site in charge of helping run that program and then a major change this year um, is that we have we are going to hire our own certificated teachers to help run our summer program. So still partnering with teaching fellows, but also incorporating a lot more of our staff. Um, I know one of the challenges is, are our teachers going to want to teach summer school? A lot of our teachers are burnt out, but we are either going to hire our own teachers or recruit substitute teachers and give them more experience with, with uh, students in the classroom. We want to hire about seven certificated teachers per site. Each site then the district will continue to hire a secretary per site. Um, we will hire health aides and RNs and LVNs as a district. And you can see there um, each site will receive a special ed aid, a bilingual aid um, in order to help run the program. And then of course, because we are hired, uh, offering this to more students, we will need more teaching fellow staff. And so the way our program looks now is that in the morning from eight to 11, there will be a focus on academics and a heavy focus on making sure that we are providing some intervention to our students in person. And then our teaching fellows staff kind of comes alongside of us and supports us in the mornings for that academic program but then in the afternoon really continues to offer those enrichment opportunities for students and so our afternoon will still look a lot um, like what kisa has in the past by making sure that we provide stem activities fitness activities field trips if they're allowed um, and, and that's kind of the differences in the two programs uh, this year Amanda or Titus, go ahead. No, I was going to actually going to segue to Amanda because I know we are mentioning California Teaching Fellows, which I'm not sure if many of are familiar with that. So I was going to ask Amanda if she can expand on on what and who California Teaching Fellows is, um, and then sort of tie that into our partnership with Kerman Unified and our other programs. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Titus and Tasha. Um, yes, so California Teaching Fellows, um, what we do there is we employ employ college-age students um, 
hoping to get into the education field. Um, and so with that, we use our existing staff there throughout the regular school year who run the after school programs and then just basically merge them into summer um, by offering a lot more leadership opportunity. What is going to be a, a great difference, of course, as you see on the side by side there where we're expanding, you know, we are um, inserting a, a lot more manpower just because of the model that we're using this year. Um, but what's wonderful about it is that we will have that push kind of in classroom experience. Um, what we're finding is that there are learning losses of all kinds. And so that is also applying to the college students that we are employing because they're not on site. You know, a lot of us in, in this virtual time, they've adjusted, but what they're really hungry for is that hands-on experience to get them where they need to be, where they want to be. And so for the summer program, um, what we do is try to make it as self-sustaining as possible. Um, of course, as um, Tasha has explained, there is a lot of you know, infrastructure that is given by the district. And so it allows us to flourish by putting on programs, whereas how we explain, um, I guess, in, in trying to give a comparison is we create kind of after school like principals and vice principals, there's a hierarchy and a leadership to it to where um, they're able to experience what it's like to not only experience leadership portions of program, but really invest and be able to offer all types of enrichment and academic support to, um, in this case, the Kerman community. Um, so additionally to this, we also um, bring on high school interns. And so we do try to, again, invest in and insert ourselves into the community as much as possible by looking at the high school, um, looking at, you know, pathways, CTE, all of those wonderful things and introduce them to what it's like and onboard them like employees which is really interesting um, and fun experience. So I oversee that part as well. And so they're all just so excited and happy to um, have the opportunity to, again, be a, a part of the community and, and be a reflection of you know, what they hope to accomplish. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is um, the, the planning process of this. Um, we actually started planning because he said it's a, it's a massive program, again, trying to serve 600 kids um, from five different schools in one district. Um, and so we start planning for the Kisa Summer Program in October is when the initial conversations start to, to be had about what the game plan is going to be for, for the year. Um, Kerman Unified has entrusted our county office and teaching fellows basically um, giving us free reign to come up with a, a plan. Um, uh, we, theme, we theme the program because it's multi-tiered. Uh, in order to run a program that's not focused around credit retrieval, um, <clears throat> we have to focus on something that's more well-rounded. How do we engage our students to get them to want to come to summer? If you haven't been to Fresno, our summers are ranging between 96 degrees and 100, 102 um, for those months that we're running it. So five-week programs, six hours a day, we really have to figure out how we need to keep our kids. And so when, when we meet in October, uh, Amanda and myself are our two, our two entities, come up with a plan and present it to Kermit Unified. And so we explain what the theme's gonna be, um, what SEL we're gonna focus on, whether it's SEL or, or emphasis on STEM. We ask the district, um, what would they like to emphasize? Is it, is it math? Is it, is it literacy? Um, we vet the books that we theme our program around. Uh, so in the, in the past, we've done the Hunger Games. And so the kids, are broken up into different pods that are representative of the, the pods in the Hunger Games. So I haven't, I haven't actually done that in a while, so I don't remember what their official names are. Um, but we theme it that way because the kids become more excited and more ingrained in the program because they don't just feel like they're coming to summer school. They're coming to an enrichment camp-like experience um, that allows them to be engaged. And so that, that's part of, of the plan of action is vetting that with the district to make sure they're okay with it. And then any tweaks that need to be done, um, we do that. And so that starts in October. Um, and then Kerman Unified is gracious enough to gather everyone within the districts for one large district summer meeting um, in January. And that's from the superintendent to transportation, food services, uh, finance, and then the principal who will be, in, in this case has been Tosh, who will be on site for the summer. And we talk everything out and lay out a map um, from January till we start the program in June. And so everyone knows what's going to happen. Everyone knows how that's going to be executed. 
Um, they're all on the same page and we, we hammer it out early and often. So there's no questions and no one's caught off guard. Food services knows the registration numbers and how many students we're gonna be serving. Transportation has um, an ample time to map out routes if necessary. Um, as you notice up there, it says Kerman High School Leadership, we hire high school interns as well. And I understand funding can be an issue for a lot of districts. We use ACES funding, supplemental um, 21st when we had it. And Kerman Unified does uh, utilizes their LCFF monies as well and Title I. And so obviously on the large scale that we we're running the program, more funding is necessary, but it's something that can be scaled down to as well. One of the other districts we partner with actually only serves 100 kids um, and that's within their own framework. And so this can be scaled down um, to a framework that works, that works for you. Uh, <clears throat> teaching fellows, actually is, I'm a product of California teaching fellows. I, I came out to Fresno um, to be a firefighter, ended up working in expanded learning in between and ended up staying in education. And so teaching fellows, luckily with the college students that we employ, a lot of them do come into it with the intent to work in education. Um, and then it's a good test for them to see if it's something that's, that they really want to pursue. And so these additional summer months, whether you are going through a third party agency um, or your own staff gives them this additional months to, to harness their skills um, and to, to, to better tune them um, to be better going into the next year. And so that's been one of the highlights of being able to serve our students better is because they get additional time in these summer months to even test out new things. I know um, within the classroom, we're always looking for, for new things to engage our kids um, fresh ways to engage them. And summer is a good way to experiment, to see what you can do, what will stick, and to use, to have smaller groups to focus on the kids on, on listening to them and, and integrating that into your classroom as well. <clears throat> uh, again, partnership details, which I, I alluded to earlier, is our staff hiring, our staff trainings, our program goals aligned with the district goals, uh, the collaborative meetings, um, program branding and program marketing. And so, as I said, we need to appeal to parents um, and students alike. And so we market the program to students as if it's a large, uh, we say summer program on, or after school program on steroids. Um, so they feel like they're coming into an experience and not just the program. And I'm sorry, um, Jennifer, I can't see you. So if I'm running over time, just please uh, let oh, me know. No problem. No, that's what happens when, um, we have several panelists. So I do have uh, several questions. Um, and this is for, for um, um, all three of you. Anyone can answer. You talked about um, how, how and where do you recruit staff or, or how many are a percentage of returning staff as people are thinking about um, doing that outreach. So like um, both Amanda and Tasha, how is this posted? How is this marketed? Um, where? Um, or is it all all folks that are already, you know, um, have committed without doing recruitment? Gotcha. I'll chime in on that one. So with us being able to plan so soon, um, and what we found is finding the best success of quality staff is, you know, just front loading them as much as we can. So definitely, again, that planning is, is really key. So um, as fellows, we have about, sorry, two, about... 1,800 to 2,000 individuals um, already hired with us working throughout the regular year. So we do have a pool to reap from. And what we do there is um, employ a lot of Google Forms, <laughs> get real Google savvy, but also again with our marketing um, and how we, we tend to communicate with our, our group of people. So a lot of new newsletters, emails, um, but then we do a lot of just old fashioned kind of word of mouth using our site leads, plugging them in with all of this information as well. Um, so with that, we survey a lot of interest beforehand. We try to uh, get a good grasp on what our teaching fellows are thinking. You know, they are college age, so some of them aren't from the area. Um, and we see teaching fellows from as far as like really all Central Valley based. So it's as far as Merced all the way down to like early Mart, Delano. Um, we, we cover a lot of territory in the north, south and central region. 
Um, and so we, we start with a simple survey. It's always great to gauge the interest of what your people are thinking. And then from there, we do certain types of follow-up. Because um, in addition to KISA, with this model, we're running different types of summer programs as well that compete. So we're even competing with ourselves. Um, but by grasping them early, trying to get them locked in, um, trying to appeal to the, the quality staff that we do have, um, and then just, just really market and try to sell ourselves. We know that we, we really do need them as much as they need us in this space because as we run through the school year, they're really hungry for that summer work as well. So we just try to make it as fun and kind of just like a, a breath to take, you know, between all of the rigorous learning that's happening during the school year, it's a chance for them as well to exercise their passions. And they have so many that they're not even able to exhibit. So we just try to play off of their strengths. You know, we are constantly asking them, what do you want to do? How do you want to contribute? Because it's very important for us to have them be creative with their leadership. Um, because working with the, the demographics that we do, we know that they have to have that type of flexibility. And so and in addition to all of that, yeah, just a lot of question asking as early on as you can, um, that's, that would be the best start. And oddly enough, staff retention has been something Amanda and I have focused on, um, but it can be a double-edged sword because we have a tier system uh, where we have a management team, a coordinator, assistant coordinator, someone who does the attendance and finances. Uh, and then we have our, our quote unquote line staff who actually work with the kids. But when, what we noticed is we're bringing people back that A, Tasha, Tasha and the district are comfortable with and are familiar with, with is great. But on the planning end, Amanda and I noticed that some people start to rest on their laurels because they know that there's a comfort level. And so they don't necessarily push the program to another height for kids that, hey, if you're running a program from K-8, they're returning every year. And so we have to figure out ways to rebrand and, and refresh and freshen up what we're delivering to them. And so sometimes the retention, depending on what position, um, we noticed can be detrimental to our growth. So we tried to enable a two-year um, not a commitment, but if you've been a coordinator for two years, we start to look outside of that now for new talent to bring new eyes and a fresh, fresh viewpoint to the program. Tasha, from the um, Kerman's lens, what, what about recruitment within your own um, school district? So the district follows uh, kind of similar processes for posting positions like they would any open position in the district. Um, and so we post the principal positions to any administrator or aspiring administrator in the district. So it doesn't have to be a current administrator, but if you hold an administrative credential, um, you can apply for any sort of summer opportunity. Um, same thing for certificated staff. And so that posting goes out like it would through our personnel department and um, teachers then can submit interest if they'd like to participate in the summer program. Um, and that goes for every position. Um, it's actually really competitive. I have to apply to be the Kisa summer school principal um, every year if I want that job. And it's a great opportunity. I love working with the teaching fellows staff because they really do come in gung ho um, to provide a great program for students. And we've seen that that has really paid off for our district as well, partnering with a, a, this kind of group because um, as looking at some of those pictures in the past of our program, we've gone on to hire a lot of those uh, college students as our teachers. And so it's been it's been a good collaborative um, process and a good way to work with one another. But that's just kind of how we recruit here in Kerman um, to fill our summer positions. Great. I have um, we have about two more minutes. So I have a few more questions. Uh, one was. When you employ high school students, you guys mentioned that, are they employed through CTTF or through the district or how, how do you employ the students, the high school students? Right, so we, we onboard them. We're able to onboard them um, as regular employees, which is, is really awesome. Um, thankfully, because we've run this for several years now, the high schools expect it. And actually it's been able to, we've been able to gain momentum even at the high school level with the students talking about it amongst themselves. Um, so they're about a handful. I mean, cause we do have to think about the amount of work we're available to offer. We do want to keep them very productive. We want it to be a very meaningful experience. So we, we do gauge, you know, how many high school students we can really bring on um, per school year. And so with Kerman, they have a CTE pathway specifically for education. And so I connect with the admin there directly. 
um, I ask for, you know, the recommendations. I actually, um, in collaboration with the principals there, have created just the criteria for the high school students to meet, um, just to, again, give them that more real life experience of what they can um, expect moving forward. Um, so from there, I get recommendations and we bring on a bunch. And then from there, it's just the usual pathway to become an employee. Um, what we've come to find, which is really neat, is that some stay with us even after high school and they're already employees. So they're ahead of a whole bunch of other people come fall for the next school year, um, already having the security of a job, knowing that they're going to be balancing their workload, you know, at, in college, but they at least have some financial security to get them there along the way. They're making money, saving. Um, and again, it's like brothers and sisters and cousins that they're seeing. So it's a really cool, fun, full circle experience. Yes. Um, well, one other question I just wanted to have, and then um, you guys are going to be with us for, through through the next panel. So folks should also be sending um, questions in the chat and um the Kermit team can respond via chat and they can add any ideas that didn't um, get said today. But on, on training before summer, we I was curious, is there like a week of training before summer or how long, you know, obviously these people again have a lot of skills. They've done it many times, but Tasha, as you're planning and as people are thinking about their calendars, how much should they set aside for, you know, training specifically to ramp up, right? For the day one of summer programming. I can, I can, do you want me to take that? So um, <clears throat> we, um, we do have a, about it, we call it, yeah, a week of training because we are dealing with college students for us. Uh, yeah. And then trying, when we align with the district, we want to make sure that the time to work with the teachers that these uh, tutors are going to be paired with. So generally there's a week that's going to be identified that works with everyone's schedules at the conclusion of, of the school year for our tutors because that way they can just specifically focus on the task at hand. And then the week is broken up into different subjects um, <clears throat> whether it's it's onboarding about summer matters, that's usually what we start off with is summer matters and why how that campaign came to be the importance of making sure that we're combating summer learning loss to ensure that the, the staff understand that that is why we are here in the position that we're in and so it's really drilled in if you guys do not under, uh, understand the summer learning loss and the slide that can occur and the different diagrams that we present then really um you're lost on what the purpose of this program is. So that's what we start off with day one. And then it's broken up into program components the rest of the week. Uh, and then again, in, in communication with the district on, okay, now when can we get them with the teachers, depending on the teachers, the school year schedule, um, sometimes that falls on a Saturday before, um, before program starts type of thing, or maybe the week before the district opens up their campus and allows our staff to now introduce themselves to, this, the, to the credential teachers that will be working, introduce themselves to the campus that they're going to be working on, and so on. So about, a, yeah, about a week or, or two if you take all the days in, but I'll say a week generally is what's what we plan out. Great. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone on the Kerman team for uh, sharing all their wisdom and experience with us today. And um, as questions come to everyone in the audience, like I said, um, though they'll be off screen for the next panel, they will be with us in the chat. So thank you again. And with that, I'm going to introduce our next panel um, and our next two speakers. Um, so today we have Doreen Hassan, who currently serves as the Associate Executive Director of Program and Community Development for the YMCA of Silicon Valley supporting early learning, after school, summer learning programs, as well as um, the WISE year-round USDA meal program. She seeks to build bridges, identify resources and opportunities to ensure greater access and equity in the community she serves. She's worked for the YMCA of Silicon Valley for 22 years. And joining Doreen is Mandy Reed, who has 19 years of experience as an educator in Gilroy Unified District, including 13 years as a program administrator of after school and summer programs. Mandy has deep experience in collaborating with a range of nonprofit community based agencies to develop and implement expanded learning opportunities for students. As a Summer Matters pilot community, Gilroy has engaged in continuous quality improvement process and is ever evolving to meet the changing needs of the communities in the time. Welcome, Mandy and Doreen.
And with that, I'm gonna, um, Mandy's gonna bring up her slides and then I will turn it over to Mandy. All right, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna actually switch to this one and share. So I just wanna start off by stating that I super lucked out when I came into my position uh, we were, our district was applying for the 21st century um, grant and we brought, they brought in partner agencies, YMCA and MOXA and CalSOAP. And so there was this group of, a collaborative group that was writing the, the designing the model. And they talked about um, the importance of collaborate, collaboration and working together. And so um, that's been our, our, model ever since um, I was hired on at that point and I got a crash course in um, expanded learning and how how everything works. I'd been a teacher before I had run an after school program from the teacher perspective um, in the past, but now I was the administrator for after school programs for the school district and um, I just I have to one it's a, it's a silly example, but I feel like it represents clearly what what we learned was um, we, we have new partnership coming in with somebody from YMCA that I'd known before. And I'll, I'll share a little, in a few minutes what our, our new summer model is gonna look like, but I was so excited and I said, oh, and, and this is what we're doing. And I thought it was this new model that Gilroy Unified had dreamed up in this meeting. And I was like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And I was telling her about it. And she said, oh, we did that a couple of years ago. I have some slides on it. So that's literally the slide deck that I'm using to present from. I literally took what YMCA had done years ago and plugged in our, our current stuff. So I just really want to highlight the importance of partnerships and um, the collaborative agencies. And I think the one of the, the biggest things that I want to point out is that the, the end product is greater than the sum of its parts. When you're working together and you're bringing people together as a team, um, it's exponential growth. So um, we have this GSD plus YMCA plus Youth Alliance equals fun and memorable plus equals a fun plus memorable learning experience. So um, I, I kind of want to share, we were part of the Summer Matters pilot community. Um, so we've, we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, so I guess I just kind of want to share part of how we brought so many partners together at the table is um, just really making sure we're coming around a common vision and a common plan and a common goal. Um, and you know, our, our program has evolved a lot over the years. And so I just kind of wanted to show, these are in your handouts, you'll get these later. Um, but I just kind of wanted to show some various models of how our program has worked together. Um, we have our, we called, it was called Superpower Summer Camp all these years. And we have a leadership team that consists of myself from the school district and um, South County Cal Soap, YMCA and Youth Alliance. And we have a team that, has, that designs everything. And, and it was uh, funny, I, I laughed. Normally summer starts in September is a saying that we have. Some, summer starts in September, we're always planning. And this year due to everything going on, we just got started. So we're kind of, we're feeling like we're, we're behind, but I think because we have the partnership and the relationships that we've had and the program model that we've had, we can just pivot and build on it and, and add and grow. And so we're really lucky that we have all these systems in place already. Um, so, you know, contacting transportation and, and food service and popping up a site, we've been doing it for years. So we have those systems in place um, that makes it really helpful. So I just, I wanted to share some of the um, past models that we've had years and years ago, we had, I thought about it when, when um, Titus was mentioning their program years ago, we had a, a Harry Potter theme one year. And so each of the groups was named, you know, different Harry Potter components. And, and what we found was the kids were all chanting and cheering or, or some of them were just random and they were chanting and cheering during rally that they wanted to, you know, they were part of whatever group and they were so proud to be part of that group. And at the end of the summer, someone said, wait a minute, why don't we just go by colleges then? So my son swears he's gonna go to LSU because when he was in first grade, his, his group was LSU. And so he still has a little tiger that the program leader gave all the kids. And so he, he I was like, you want to go to Louisiana? Okay. But that, that idea of just making that fun and exciting thing and tying it to something um, that really gives them a vision. So our, so years ago, our theme switched to this college careers and community. That's been a theme we've had for years. We loved it. We were stuck with it. Um, we even had uh, each week was themed for freshman, sophomore, junior, you know, and then at, at one point in 2017, we had 
daily components, we've always had STEM, visual performing arts, healthy living. Um, and in 2017, we actually had a different theme for each strand. So there was, you can see there was a lot of different themes going on. Um, we, why is it not changing? There we go. Um, so this is our 20, 2017 learning goal. So just, I just really wanna point out that part of what we learned in, in, in as part of Summer Matters is the importance of these themes and goals and the continuous improvement process and how vital that is. Um, so these were what our, our learning goals, student learning goals were um, back in 2017. We had assessments, we figured out how we were gonna measure them. We really, it took a lot of work as a team to, co to come around so that when we're bringing all these various partner agencies together, we all know what we're working towards. We all have the same end goal. Um, and then uh, these are our quality improvement goals from that year. So um, I, I just wanna share a variety of what we did so that people are able to see, kind of have an idea of how, of, um, how things have evolved over time. So we used the CASP, we lived by the CASP. This was the, before the, the new CASP, this was the original CASP, the Comprehensive Assessment of Summer Programs. Um, so it was a very in-depth indicator tool that we used to evaluate our program. Um, we, it, was, it was funny to me as I was looking at this and I said in 2017, we went from, we had grown one point from 2.4 to 3.4. Um, and I'll refer to that again in a minute, but basically really looking at all of these goals and identifying what is it we wanna work on? What are those standard, what are those um, indicators that we really think we need to focus on? So these were what we had come up with in 2017. This is our model for 2019. Um, we had evolved again some, and we decided that year, we still had self uh, or STEAM. We, as self, we decided was social, emotional learning and, and fitness. So we figured that was kind of our healthy living. We still brought in um, the healthy body and nutrition and yoga. We still, it was more about health and fitness, but we wanted to bring in that social emotional learning component as well. We uh, worked with, for a couple of years with um, someone from a local university who wanted to design a um, values integrated liter teaching and uh, learning program for or literacy program for our students. So. That was our vital component. So these are just different um, models. It's always it's always a little bit different. We're always changing and growing how we work. Um, these were the goals we had. She actually had created these assessments herself, these reasoning skills and, and the, this education insight. So we were measuring, it got a little bit more academic with um, qualitative evaluation of classroom discussion. So that was because we had a partner coming in that was bringing that component into our program. Um, and then uh, that 2019, with this, we our goals looked a little bit different. We still used CASP. I think it's funny that after nine years, we still had only grown one point from 2.4 to 3.4. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out about that is as our program has grown and evolved over the years, when we first did the CASP, we were like, oh yeah, we got this. We're good, we're doing good. And we, when we self-scored, we were really high, but luckily with that time, we had Partnership for Children and Youth and the National Summer Learning Association that came in and observed us. And they pointed out the things we were doing well, but they also pointed out things we could learn from. And then this, our self-reflection increased year after year. And as our leadership team was people who had grown in the program and, and, and we all knew what we were looking for. It's not necessarily that our program didn't grow as much, but our perception of what constitutes a four or a three on the, when we were scoring it, we were like, no, like, yeah, we did that, but we could have done it better. So then that's what I think why the scores, if we had, were scoring ourselves on the same lens we had years ago, you know, we probably would have, we would have scored much higher, but our, our expectations for ourselves and what we want for our program has also evolved. Um, so I just, that's something I want to talk, you know, that I want to think about is when you're looking, knowing that you're starting where you are now and you're going to grow from there and, and there's always room for growth. That was a, that was a challenge for some of our staff at the beginning was how do you, um, you know, they wanted that idea of there's always room for growth. So these are all, uh, then, then I wanted to show this in case that was all overwhelming. This was our 20, 20, summer, summer 2014. Um, this was what we had. This was our goals and our quality improvement goals at the bottom. That was what we had. So, and that was after four years of working on, on summer and focusing on summer. Um, so I just want to point out that it really is a matter of starting where you are. These tools are vital in bringing the team together, um, bringing the partnerships together and looking at, and, and these aren't created by an individual person. These are created as a team, everybody working together to find out what do we need? How do we, how do we support the students? 
Um, so, um, like I said, we've we've had our model going for years. So we just, um, I think it was probably about a month ago that we discovered that we were going to be running a new model, and we started talking about how that you know what it can look like. And with the expanded learning funding um, that's coming down for summer, our you know our district said, hey, we want. I, we were talking to the teacher, the t the teacher on special assignments, the literacy coaches, and they said, you know. Power schools got this. They've got the engagement, the enrichment, the fun. Now let's just figure out how to work in the academics more. So um, again, having those relationships already in place um, was was really valuable. So this is kind of some info that we're going to be looking at for this summer. Um, I think I just wanted to make sure that you know necessity is the mother of invention. Um, with the way things are going right now, we have. Um, you know, the collective impact model is really important and bringing the partner agencies together. I cannot emphasize that enough. Like I said, our school district, we thought we came up with this new model and YMCA had already done it years ago. So bringing in those areas of expertise, we, we wanted, um, we're looking at, I was, I'm looking at redoing the strategic plan for, for this program and how do we involve families and how do I engage and how do we do um, um, outreach to the community and someone who had worked with us years ago is now doing, um, for still, still with Youth Alliance, is now doing outreach um, and focus groups and empathy interviews. And so he's gonna come back and help us lead that part. So really working with the relationships, the partners, I, and it's not even just around expanded learning. There are partner communities in your community. If you're a school district, there are nonprofit partner agencies who want to support you and your students, and they are fabulous. So it really is a matter of reaching out to those local agencies and connecting with them and talking about how can you make it work. Um, so this year we're really looking at being trauma informed, having trauma informed expanded learning for social justice, and the money, the new advanced money coming in doesn't you know doesn't hurt. We have we've had our summer program money and now we're getting to have some additional um, um, funding so we can bring in the Go Unified. Um, teachers into what our summer program looks like. So now this year it's gonna be, I'm gonna try to move really quick, but it's a comprehensive model. We have our um, power school summer camp that we, we've always had at Superpower Summer Camp. We're not calling it that this year because it's different. This year is gonna be really different. There's a lot more um, academics that's necessary. So this model, um, what we are doing is we have, our program is gonna operate like we normally do. We'll do rally in the morning, we'll have whole group, this year we're going to have credentialed teachers in with our staff so we'll have we're also bringing special ed students in so we're bringing the club you know we've always had after school or our program and special ed and migrant and now we're bringing everybody together so that all of the gilroy program unified programs can work together we're going to have um teachers will be pulling students out for a small uh, 45 minute four students at a time intervention group from within the classroom and then our power school staff are going to continue offering um, with centers with the, with the program leader support um, in the morning. And then we will um, go into uh, in lunch in the afternoon that we'll have our whole program. So we're working with our, our literacy coaches for the school district. They're designing the content we're going to use in the morning, which is a new step for us. We've never had this level of support before, which is why it makes it OK that we didn't start as early as we would because they're doing the curriculum planning for us. Um, for that morning component. So um, really they understand the importance of making sure kids are engaged and having fun and learning. So these are the centers we're talking about drawing and labeling and chants and art center and exploration. And so they really understand that idea of making it engaging for the kids. And this is what our staff will do in the morning while students are being pulled out. Um, this literally was the slide YMCA had used. I literally just copied it. Um, I thought this was a new concept, but it's not. So we have our teachers are gonna be pulling out and doing small group instruction um, for uh, using, we're, we're using the same, same literacy uh, intervention curriculum as well um, that the teachers are gonna be able to do with students. This is ex pictures from the YMCA's program from the past. Um, so this is not uh, in COVID era. So this is just an example of what we're hoping our program model can look like this year. Um, and one of the, the highlights that I'm really excited about is, you know, teachers are tired, they're exhausted, they've worked so hard, they've had to figure out new things. It's all been really difficult. And what they're doing now is we're giving them the opportunity to teach summer school and all they have to do is engage with their small group of four kids and wrote in doing small group intervention. So we're telling them you don't have to do attendance, you don't have to do any of the other programs, it's just running 
um, just running these programs. So I'm gonna now turn it over to our fabulous Doreen Hassan from YMCA, who we've been working with for years so she can talk about their program. Thank you, Mandy, and thank you to all the prior presenters. So today we're here to talk about creative staffing. So what does that mean? Reach out to your community partners, whether it's a YMCA, Catholic Charities, Boys and Girls Club, or the current expanded learning partner on your school campus. We know we cannot get to collective impact alone. Collective impact is about reaching to those who are invested in youth and youth outcomes. And so at the YMCA, the past 20 years, we've been focused on summer learning, ensuring achievement, belonging, and relationship building. That is why partners are critical because they have their relationships with young people, on-campus providers. Mandy talked about engaging the TOSAs, the teachers, the uh, special ed instructors, and, as well as your partners. So you do not have to do it alone. In our YMCA model over the last 20 years, we've been utilizing teachers in the morning at a one to eight ratio with a YMCA staff. Then in the afternoon, the YMCA staff takes the group of 16 students, because it's one to eight in the morning with the teacher, and we engage in all the activities that Mandy talked about. And truly, to get to what we want to do this summer, we have to coordinate efforts with our community partners. If you don't have a community partner on campus right now, I encourage you to, to identify and talk to your local city folks, um, uh, resource centers. You know, in the pandemic, there has been a wonderful effort in, in really identifying who partners are and what services they can provide. And we really want to utilize that whole child approach, provide food access, resources beyond what they're doing in, in the classroom in the summer. Um, because tr truly, it takes a village to support young people during this really really devastating time. And I use the word devastating because young people are in social isolation, may not be able to navigate the digital world that we're operating in. And for the first time, facing the, the challenges of hunger and poverty at levels never experienced before. So to truly maximize the funding dollars that are coming down to us as a windfall of money, we've got to work together. And that's the message I want to send today. Fortunately, the Y's been able to return Train our staff. We're locally running 40 in-person programs serving 2,000 kids. We're rolling 85% of those staff into summer learning programs or our traditional summer day camp. We're using an equity lens and prioritizing our staff to work in the schools that need our support the most. Um, I'll go to the next slide. And I also want to just emphasize that, um, so Mandy, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I want to emphasize that parents are also our partners. And if you're having difficulty finding staff, asking if they know of anyone who is looking for work and to not work in the silo and just post on EdJoin. That was one of the criticisms at our board meeting. You know, um, why are you only posting on EdJoin? Reach out to families, reach out to your partners, reach out to your community. And I have a quote on the next slide about family engagement. And the Harvard School of Education did tons of research. When we know families are engaged, young people will do better. So, um, so quick outcomes from our programs, 93% of uh, families say that their child enjoys reading more, that they're more engaged. Um, and ultimately, it's about collective impact, improve confidence, improve reading skills. This is we know that when we put in the appropriate levers, we will get the outcomes. So reach out to your partners. That's my message to you. Thank you so much. Turn it back to Jessica. Awesome. I, so a few questions quickly. Um, one was folks had questions about just safety. And Doreen, I think one, you guys have been running programs, but, and Mandy, so about these different models, how are you guys approaching safety? And again, all of you, I know have already served some kids in person, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go ahead. We have uh, is, I, I'm feeling like she's frozen, so I'll I'll step in. Um, yeah. And I have to say, YMCA is how we did it when when Gilroy yep. Unified was looking at opening schools and bringing kids back. Um, okay, Doreen, you kind of cut out, so I'll, I I stepped in for a second. Um, Am I back? So I'll. You're, you're back. back. I think you're back now. Um, okay. but I, and I just, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just, so I was just saying that when we wanted to open our schools, we weren't sure how to do it safely. We turned to YMCA. 
-hmm. and YMCA came in with their team and their expertise and their experience from all over the, you know, the area. And they came in and they said, here's what you do. Here's how you do it. Here's how you do the safety. So I'll turn it over to Doreen so she can explain some of that. For me. Yeah. Follow the guidance. We had zero transmission, wear a mask, practice social distancing and, and clean appropriately and have kids wash their hands when they arrive before they leave and in, in every transition. And then um, I wanted you guys to speak to um, either partnering with universities in the past um, to mm -hmm. recruit. And then also, I know you guys, um, Doreen, you mentioned in our conversation, retired teachers. So just giving some people some ideas of other types yeah. of um, communities to reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. Your local community colleges, uh, as well as universities those who are pursuing a teacher uh, credential, and um, your retired teachers, those that nurtured and supported your program. We have several teachers that come back and teach just for the six weeks because it gives them that sense of fulfillment. And then, you know, they're enjoying their retirement the rest of the year. We had, I know, um, Part of the partnership that you know i wanted to reiterate that we talked we're a year-round model right so we look at after school and summer and we've had we have students our high school students have to get volunteer hours before they can graduate and so they come and they volunteer while they're with us while they're in high school so many of our staff have either been past participants or past high school volunteers or both we have kids who've stuck with us every year moving on um, and I know they spend a lot of time, our, our program directors spend some time at, out at the junior college and they walk around and they're talking to you know, people that they've met over time and they talk about, yeah, so really recruiting and just um, building those relationships. Great. Um, well, I want to thank both Mandy and Doreen for all the work they do every day on behalf of kids and families and sharing all their expertise. And as we stated at the beginning, all that great content that both Doreen and Mandy provided, as well as Kermit, is all going to be provided in PDF. So you can look at calendars, you can look at structures, you can look at the list of staff. These will be resources for everyone here on the call that uh, we will provide following this. Um, and we are also going to be sending a recording of this session to everyone who registered on the webinar. And we'll also be posting on our website and social media. Um, as far as other resources for summer planning, I want to mention, um, again, as posted, uh, we have um, a, a landing page with all these resources. Next Thursday, we'll have another webinar for one hour on engaging high school youth in summer. And I think you guys heard high school youth mentioned multiple times today, both as skill development, leadership development, and staffing, and mentorship of their peers and other members of their community. And as we conclude at 1059, so impressed, uh, we want to thank the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence for supporting us to offer these series. And we would very much appreciate everyone filling out the survey that's been put in the chat. You can link it now. Don't wait for me to end. And why this is so important is folks talked about that 4.6 billion. Well, the state needs to hear from folks about what tools and resources they need to make summer happen. There's resources out there to provide technical assistance and training. And that survey, what you say in that survey will directly influence the statewide tools, training and resources and investments that get made. And I just wanna say again, thanks to all the speakers we had today and thank you for everyone who joined us in your busy day. And we look forward to seeing you next, um, next time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.